With Manchester United on course to have one off, if not our worst Premier League start in history, having lost to Brighton 2-1 and Brentford 4-0, there's been a lot of talk around the club about what has caused the downfall of this once great club. Now for me, and I think a lot of people, we know the main reason for that, and that is the glaze of our ownership. They take money out of the club and don't put any in. They put us in debt. They don't upgrade the facilities, the, the uh, training ground, the stadium, and so on. And that's the uh, kind of a direct role they've played in the downfall of Manchester United. But it's more damaging than that, this ownership. They play a massive indirect role in the the day-to-day running of the club that has caused this massive downfall. And I think is even more damaging than the direct role they've played. And today, that's kind of what we're going to get into. So we're not really going to talk about the fact the Glazers don't put in enough money into the transfer budget. The fact they take out loads of dividends. The fact that they haven't upgraded the stadium and the training facilities in however long they've been here. Because while that is all shocking still and just shows how bad of an owner that an ownership they are, you can you can still be successful with that in, in place. The indirect role they've played is what for me makes success almost impossible with this ownership. And that's what again we'll be talking about. So let's talk about it. The indirect role they've played is kind of to do with the day-to-day running of the club. Now, we all know the Glazers don't really have anything to do with that. They've left that to, well, formerly Ed Woodward and now Richard Arnold. The big issue with these two guys is they don't know about football. They don't care about football. They've never been footballing people. And this sort of leadership on the day-to-day running side of the business or of the football club is kind of where we get to our first talking point, and that's recruitment. The recruitment at this club since Sir Alex Ferguson retired has been an absolute joke. Now, since Sir Alex Ferguson retired in 2013, Manchester United have had five permanent managers. David Moyes, Louis van Gaal, Jose Mourinho, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, and now Eric Ten Hag. All five of these managers have completely different f- philosophies to their predecessor, maybe aside from David Moyes, and Sir Alex Ferguson, but even then, Sir Alex Ferguson pretty much selected that um, that appointment rather than Ed Woodward at the time. What this shows is a clear sign of no joined up thinking, and that is not how you plan long term for a football club or for a business in general. This kind of lack of plan and joined up thinking is what has led to Manchester United constantly being in phases of rebuild every three years when we eventually get a new manager, when the the last one has failed. And this all results in lists like this from Jamie Carragher and Gary Neville, where they've ranked the Manchester United signing since Alex Ferguson's retirement. And we've got 24 players in the red. Now, you can disagree with some of the, the um, rankings on that list, but... The fact we've only got two players that both of them can agree are good signings and one of them in Bruno Fernandes you can disagree with and you could argue should be in a lower tier and 24 players are in the red. Now, even if you want to say some of them players in the red should be moved to amber or green, 24 is far too many. Even if you if you could take 10, 10 of them out of the red and 14 signings, you would still argue is too many. And we've got 24 of them. And this is caused by managers coming in and having to use and deal with players that aren't suited to the way they play. For example, you have Daily Bling coming under Louis van Gaal, only to be shipped off when Jose Mourinho comes in because he doesn't suit his style. Same with Romelu Lukaku and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Lukaku didn't suit the counter-attacking style of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, so he was got rid of. wan Basaka the same with Eric Ten Hag. There's too many players that managers are forced to try and use and get the best out of, even though they don't suit the way they try and play football, simply because, A, we can't ship them off because we're on way, they're on way too high wages, B, because we've overspent on them and we're too stuck up our own arse in a sense to accept we've made a mistake here and we'll take a loss to get him out of the club. And to kind of top it all off, we have then those in charge of player recruitment overspending on players that are either not good enough 
or players that the manager doesn't even want because they couldn't manage to get the main target for that manager due to their own incompetence or is it whether it's due to not wanting to spend that much. For example, you look at Harry Maguire. We got Harry Maguire for £80 million because we overspent and we kind of panicked because all the other players who were better than him, we weren't getting because we messed them deals up already. Even just looking at some of the other deals we've done, Morgan Schneiderlin, Donny van der Beek, Matteo Damian, Fred and Cavani. These aren't players that were A, first choice of the manager and B, in some sense, was a panic buy. Cavani was never on Manchester United's radar. We got him on deadline day because we messed up with Jaden Sancho. We wanted, when we signed Fred, Mourinho has said he wanted four or five players. He got one. Darmian. Well, he was hardly ever used, was he? Morgan Schneiderlin. The same. And Louis van Gaal has come out and said, these, were, these players weren't my first choice. These were third and fourth choice. Donny van der Beek. We wanted Jack Grealish that summer. But we got Donny van der Beek because he was cheaper. That is a mess. Again, what makes it even worse is sometimes when the manager does get them at the player he wants, he gets them too late. So you look at Jaden Sancho and Bruno Fernandes. We got Jaden Sancho a year late. We got Bruno Fernandes six months late. And some managers don't even get the players they want at all. David Moyes wanted Tony Cruz, wanted Gareth Bale, didn't get either of them. And had to settle for just Marouane Fellaini that first summer. And you look at the club now. How long have we been in the hunt for Frankie De Jong? And Eric Ten Hag still hasn't got his man. It is a joke recruitment. And again, this is all caused by who the Glazers have put in charge of the day-to-day -day running of the club. It's the personnel. It, we've got in people who aren't good enough. Now, the second big issue is player personnel. Given all the failures of recruitment, we have a mixed match of players who simply aren't good enough or aren't suited to the way Eric Ten Hag currently looks to play. These players aren't used to playing high possession, dominant football, high pressing football, and simply aren't good enough to do that. And we've seen that with both Eric Ten Hag and Ralph Ragnick, who both came in to try and play pressing football, and these players weren't having any of it. And I think you look at the spine of this football team, the, them problems are most clear. And look, I think when, you have to, when you're doing this, you have to remove bias because you might like some of these players for whatever reason. But you've got to remove that bias when you're kind of analysing the state the club is in. For example, De Gea. I like De Gea as a goalkeeper, but he's not good enough to play under an Eric Ten Hag system from what we've seen. Now, maybe he could become that. And Eric Ten Hag seems to believe in training he's showing he can be. But from everything we've ever seen of David De Gea, he can't play as a sweeper. He can't come and claim crosses. His distribution isn't good enough. And these are three massive attributes you want from an Eric Ten Hag goalkeeper. Especially when then he signed his centre-back in Lissandro Martinez, who is five foot eight or something like that. He needs his goalkeeper to come help him. Um, claim crosses when crosses are being targeted targeted at him. You saw that with whether it was Onana, Martin Sketlenburg at Ajax. They were they were claiming crosses and helping Yuri and Timber and Lissandro Martinez. And De Gea can't do that. So that's always going to put him in danger. And we saw that against Brentford for the second goal from the corner. Ball comes in. He should claim it but doesn't. I think the centre-backs are largely fine. I mean, people will always hate Harry Maguire. I think it, with the right system around him, he's fine. We've got Rafael Varane. We've got Lissandro Martinez. We've got um, Eric Bailly, who I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of, but he's okay. And we've got Victor Lindelof. I think centre-back-wise, Manchester United are fine. You then look in midfield. Now, we've got some good midfielders. I think Donny van der Beek's a good midfielder. Eriksen's a good midfielder. I think there's question marks around Bruno Fernandes at times. But you look at deeper in our midfield, the two, again, two massive positions in our Eric Ten Hag system, especially that number six role, we've got Fred and McTominay. Neither of them are good enough. Now, there seems to be this idea about at Manchester United that Fred is somehow good enough and McTominay's not. Neither of them are good enough. Neither of them can pass the ball particularly well. Fred, for me, is just the better of the bad bunch. But because... He gets he got compared to McTominay. They got the whole McFred kind of tagline. 
Fred now seems to, now he's kind of broken away from that. It's like Fred's good enough. Fred's not good enough. And neither is McTominay. But both of them continue to have to start for Manchester United and have done for the last two managers. That's a joke. Neither of them can pass well. Neither of them are great dribblers. What do they offer? I can see McTominay offers what height? But Fred, he's, I think he's a better passer, maybe a better dribbler than McTominay and probably a better presser. But apart from for that, what, um, that, that's still not good enough. And I think you, you look at them two, I think we've got the worst double pivot in those two in the league. And I'm not sure how, what team McTominay starts for in the Premier League. And I'm not sure what teams Fred starts for in the Premier League, to be honest. So how how can we continue with that for for another manager? You then look at the front line. Cristiano Ronaldo and Anthony Martial as our strikers. Neither of them are players you can say will be here for the next three years. So who is that? Who's the striker that we're going to rely on for the next three years? Unless you can get Anthony Martial back at his best, who are you relying on this season? If we look at our starting 11s from this season so far against Brighton and Brentford, out of that starting 11, there are question marks around David De Gea, Diego Dallo, Harry Maguire, Luke Shaw, Scott McTominay, Fred, Bruno Fernandes and Marcus Rashford on whether they're all good enough. That is far too many. For, for a team that's meant to be kind of competing for the top three, at least, to be competing for trophies, how can you have so many of your, your first team players being questioned on whether they are good enough to play for the club? And again, this all comes down to those in charge of the club and the recruitment team that have left Manchester United in this sorrow state. Yet, Tin Hag doesn't get backed to try and sort this out. He hasn't got his, the plays he wants. For example, Eric Ten Hag wants Frankie Dion. We haven't got him. He wanted Anthony. We haven't got him. We, apparently, he wants Gakpo. We haven't got him. So, he's having to trial things like Christian Eriksen playing as a six because while he's not a six, but he's, he's kind of best equipped with the qualities he wants from a six. So, someone who can take the ball off the back line, can kind of dribble, can kind of progress the play, break the line, because Fred and McTominay can't. And that is when you start seeing results like the Brentford sit 4-0, because you're playing square pegs and round holes to try and get your system to work the best. And obviously, it's not going to work all the time. And that's what we saw against Brentford. And yes, I think Brentford was a kind of... We were unlucky... You look at some of the goals, three out of the four goals are mistakes and De Gea's part. But we got dominated in that game. And it's because we are having to trial things constantly to try and get Ten Hag's system to work the best it can because simply he doesn't have the personnel out at the club already. So what is the solution to this? Well, of course, it starts with the Glazers selling the club, doesn't it? The Glazers sell the club, then we will see change. The, the issue is, will they? Now, so over the last few days, there has been news on potential takeovers. Now, the first there was Michael Keaton, who was planning on setting up a consortium to kind of initiate a hostile takeover of the club. And he was calling on Sir um, Jim Radcliffe to kind of join that consortium to take over the club. Since um, Jim, Sir Jim Radcliffe has come out on his own, in a bid to buy the club off of the Glazers. Apparently, it might start off as a 25% stake in the club with a plan to take more shares and to take over full control of the club as time goes on. But at the moment, nothing's gone through and we can hope that will happen. But whether it will happen or not, we're not sure. Now, the second part of the solution is getting proper footballing people in the door and, a he and in charge of the day-to-day -day going on at the club. Of course, at the moment, we have both Stephen Fletcher and John Murta in charge. However, we need better than that. We need players and people that can kind of identify the problems and have pedigree in the game. John Murta and Darren Fletcher don't have that. Darren Fletcher was a great midfielder in his day, but what does he know about running a football club? He doesn't. What's annoying is we had this. We had this in Ralph Ragnick at the club last season. But because he was open and honest and he identified the problems, 
We got rid of him. He said we need 10 new players. He said this is open heart surgery on the club. That's what we needed to sort this club out. He said it. He was open and he was honest. And he, he identified that in six months. And we got rid of him. And why? Because he was open and honest. And because it would have spent and cost the Glazers money. That's why we don't have him anymore. If he was at the club still, we would be a much better and more suited club and more suited to go pr pressure the likes of Man City and Liverpool. Because that's realistically where we should be. With Ralph Ragnick in charge of then the day-to-day -day runnings of the club, he's able then to bring in the, the contacts he has because that's what Ralph Ragnick brings. He brings contacts. He's able to recruit the right staff using said contacts and help the manager bring in the right players Again, using his contacts, allowing for the club to have a long-term strategy, meaning even if Eric Ten Hag fails, and it's a big if, but if Eric Ten Hag fails, then the next manager we bring in would be the right profile to pick up where well, Eric Ten Hag has already done and help to take us further forward and make minor changes here and there, rather than a whole structural change like we've seen at, um, at the club since Sir Alex Ferguson's retired with the five different permanent managers we've had. And the like what we've seen Man City do with the likes of Mancini to Pellegrini to Pep Guardiola and then maybe to someone like a, who knows, a Mikel Arteta, for example, after Pep leaves. That's how Manchester United fixes their issues. Anyway, that's going to be it from me today. If you have enjoyed Please do hit that like button below and subscribe if you are new and you haven't already. That would be greatly appreciated. And let me know what changes you would make at Manchester United if given the opportunity. Anyway, like I said, thank you for watching and I'll see you all in the next one. In a bit. Peace.